Thank you all for joining us for the first event in our two-part series, Recipes for Accessibility, organized by the Boston University Gastronomy Program and sponsored by BU's Diversity and Inclusion Office. My name is Amber Sampson. My pronouns are she, her, and visually, I am a white blonde woman with red lipstick. I'm disabled, a professional chef and graduate student in BU's gastronomy program and will be moderating this evening's events. So I am based in Phoenix, Arizona, home of the Akna Awesome and Peeposh people. I want to acknowledge that BU resides on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Wapanoag and Massachusetts people. Land acknowledgements are a small step toward ensuring a culture of respect, truth, and accountability in our community. I'd also like to encourage those in attendance to check out the many events in the BU Arts Initiative, which we're hosting as part of the Indigenous Voices in the Americas series. Tonight, we will be joined by two chefs, Brian Charleston, former director of technology at the Carroll Center for the Blind, and Alexis Hilliard, creator of Stump Kitchen, who will both be demonstrating a recipe that is important to them. In addition to celebrating the skills and experiences of disabled cooks, we hope this event helps spark conversations and a deeper understanding of how ableism, as well as adaptability, function in food spaces. Finally, you're welcome to keep your cameras on, cook along with us, but we do ask that you remain muted for the entirety of the event. If you have any questions for our guests, please drop them in the chat and I will be reading them out loud during or at the end of each demo. Now, I'd like to formally introduce our first cook for the evening, Brian Charlson. While living in Salem, Oregon in the 80s, Brian owned and operated Brian's Place, a 52-seat cafeteria in a state office building working for the Oregon State Senate. He then moved to Massachusetts, where he was director of technology at the Carroll Center for the Blind for over 30 years. In addition to overseeing the agency's general technological needs, he also oversaw the accessibility programs where a team tested and developed software to ensure other websites and services were fully accessible for blind and visually impaired users. Brian has presented on adaptive technological subjects at numerous local, national, and international conferences. His love for cooking became an at-home activity where he now cooks for family and charity. He is now remodeling a just for fun kitchen in his basement where he intends to host a podcast for those who cannot use their vision to cook, tentatively titled Brian's Man Cave Kitchen. Tonight, Brian will be making fajitas. So without further ado, please take it away, Brian. Does it start over? Start over? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I don't know why I'm starting over. That's okay. Uh, I'm glad to have you all here sharing my kitchen and my passion with me today. I have to tell you that second kitchen is three times the size of the kitchen I use on a daily basis. This is what we refer to as the upstairs kitchen. And let me begin by giving you a very brief tour of the very small kitchen. At one end of the U-shaped kitchen, we have the refrigerator, the double doors up above and freezer down below. Not a configuration I recommend, but it's what came with the kitchen. I've got the countertop that I use <clears throat> for doing prepping, followed by a very shallow sink, because this is such a small kitchen, the only way I could get a dishwasher in it is to get the one and only dishwasher that fits under a sink. Then I have my cleaning station, always thinking that uh, sanitation is an important part of any good kitchen, healthy kitchen. I have a appliance uh, garage in the back corner here with my instant pot in front of it and I'll be talking more about that shortly. Again some more prep space. Typically in this area I keep things that are just to the left of the stove for constant use. Then my electric stove 
I've always cooked electric. I've never had the gift of being able to cook on gas. I'd love to do that someday. Hasn't happened for me as of yet. This is flat top, specifically chosen for the ease of cleaning. I'll turn around here. In this corner, I have my microwave oven, which is a talking microwave oven, and I'll demonstrate that a bit in a moment. And lastly, uh, the long counter along the final of the U of the kitchen. And it is typically where we have a coffee station uh, as well as the microwave and a deep fat fryer. But for this demo, we reconfigured so I could use all the space. Now, I'm going to start my prep by getting things going that can do it for themselves. This is flour tortillas. I do make my own flour tortillas when time permits and space permits, but today these are just commercial flour tortillas and I'm going to pop them into my oven. It's one of the things I want to show you is normally in an oven, you wouldn't think about grabbing it there, but in mine you can because I've placed a silicon hose like device along the front edge. So that's totally touchable. Really important because most of the burns I've ever had in an oven were on my forearm from reaching in and finding the racks had been adjusted to a height I wasn't expecting. So let me pop those in so those can stay warm. Again, continuing to deal with the accessibility of things. This particular oven took quite some time to locate. It had to have certain features that worked for me. Most modern ovens these days are so screen controlled that it makes it very difficult for a blind or visually impaired person to use it. So I place sometimes some stickers on it like this moon shaped one and this hourglass shaped one to indicate what that control does, deals with timing. I don't even remember what the moon one does. I use it so seldom. But more importantly, I selected this because there's parts of this plastic face that feels frosted and parts that are smooth. And by use, doing that, I can set things. I know that this smooth area is the on off button. I'm turning it off. I'm then going to go over here to this round surface and push bake. Then I'm going to go over here to push start. And then I'm going to use the arrow keys to bring it down from the start point of 350 down to 250 by counting the number of beeps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Goes down five degrees for each beep. So I should be at 250 now. So that's the oven for now. Uh, moving on, I'm going to go back over here. I took a flight steak last night and with it three fourths frozen to make it easier to slice thin. I sliced it thin and then put it into a marinade in this Ziploc bag. Uh, the marinade's made up of equal parts of pineapple juice, Worcestershire sauce, uh, avocado oil, a jalapeno, uh, rather a chipotle pepper, and some salt and pepper. I'm going to take this and drop it into my colander in the bowl in the sink. And give it a quick press. I want this to drain for a bit so that when I put it into my fry pan, uh, I can get a sear on it rather than a steam. And I'm gonna move over here and give a quick rinse to my hand. Brian, while you're yeah. washing your hands, I want to acknowledge for everyone watching that Brian is aided by Leslie, his sister, who is taking the video. Brian, I have a quick question for you as Leslie gives us a brief hand wave into the screen. Um, when you were learning the tools for your uh, oven, how did you learn the timing of the counting? Was that something that you had to read in the accessible manual or did you just adapt that skill with the oven itself? Uh, again, when I went shopping for this, I specifically was looking for how I could do controls and the best control systems I found always started with a starting temperature of 350 and the up and down arrows moved you five degrees in either direction. In the good ones, they do not rotate. So you don't go up to the maximum temperature of 500, press up arrow one more time and find yourself down at the minimum temperature of 180. They always hit a absolute top or absolute bottom. So you can't accidentally do that. Again, the beep is a really valuable 
accessibility tool rather than holding your finger on the button until it scrolls to what you want. You have to press it once for each time. Say hello. Exactly. <laughs> You're I'm good? supposed to say hello. There you go. She's good again. <laughs> My uh, sister also has a passion for cooking, but there's such a difference between how she cooks and I cook. She's more of that person who opens the fridge, sees what's available, and then comes up with something. I'm more of a plan ahead kind of person. So I make sure I have all the ingredients or go shopping for them. And I know what I'm going to cook several days before I do that. I may make last minute adjustments, but I'm very much a plan ahead kind of person. Speaking of planning ahead, because I'm cooking with cast iron, I'm going to move this to the burner. And again, this is a flat burner. So I'm going to take my splatter shield off here for a second, center it roughly on the burner. Though again, I can't feel where the burner is. I'm going to turn the correct knob. The left side is the frontmost. And this is a burner within burner situation. So I'm doing it counterclockwise till it's roughly oh, a little off of straight up and down. So it's at high. I'm going to let this heat up while I move on to the next task. Moving over to my cutting board. Now, the big things for being a blind person doing cooking, everybody worries about safety and how do you know it's done. So here's where we're going to deal with the safety question in the first place, in addition to that way of avoiding getting burned. And that is, I always put my knife and cutting board away from me, handle on my dominant side, blade away. So when I reach for it, I know where the blade edge is so I can avoid it. Now, I have heard so many people tell me how I should cut an onion. I cut the onion the way I do out of habit, not out of some kind of wonderful answer to the great job of cutting. So I'm holding it stem side toward me, slicing left to right as I turn the onion, cut off as little as I can. Again, knife blade away, garbage bowl, do the same thing for the stem end. Come on, Brian. There we go. Lay it flat. Down through the center. While you peel that onion, uh, I want to let you know that you can take as long as you need and also uh, Kelly has come into the chat to let you know that you're cooking one of their favorites. For people asking about recipes, yes, recipes uh, should have been available when you registered and as well um, as after this conversation. So you can enjoy Brian's fajita recipe anytime you want. So here I'm cutting them into half moons, uh, left to right. I prefer to cut left to right. And then I'm going to cut them opposite way here into a medium dice, sliding it on the blade of the knife so that I have a bigger piece to work with. And I'm cutting this on a cutting pad and you'll see why I do that in a moment. One of my frustrations when people offer to help me in my kitchen is I feel like I do things so much faster than they do and to some degree more uniform than they do. So there, one sweet onion diced. Now I'm going to do a similar thing with a red bell pepper. My family prefers red bell peppers over green peppers. They like them sweeter. Cut the top off. Now I'm going to be salvaging some of what I'm calling scrap right now for other purposes later, but I'm trying to make two even surfaces by cutting the top and bottom off. Then end down, end down to the meridian. Again, knife blade away from me. Again, drop off the seeds and membrane. And repeat that same process here. And lay it flat. a series of strips. My sister is 
biting her tongue because she so much wants to tell me how to do things slightly differently. <laughs> she does that whenever we are in the kitchen cooking together. So I just smile, nod, and do it my way anyway. And yes, I'm adding it to the onion. You also have the luxury of being able to cut an onion with your eyes closed. I don't have that option. You're, you're poor. <laughs> First half, continue with the second half. I started cooking. I was uh, from a multi generational family, we had five generations living within two blocks of one another as I was growing up. So my number one inspiration for cooking was my great grandmother, a lovely German lady who uh, taught me lots of things, almost talked me out of cooking one day when she asked me to take a look in a pot. And uh, with a little step stool she kept in her kitchen so little kids could uh, learn more about cooking. Um, I lifted the lid and she was making head cheese. Well, if you guys know what head cheese is, it's a little startling to open a pot and see a pig's face looking back at you. <laughs> Nonetheless, almost convinced me not to cook. How I'm going to return back over to my that yeah, very screaming hot. Now, one of the things I do to tell whether something's centered is I run my hand around the edge and see how much the heat is coming up outside of the periphery of the pot. In this case, it's pretty centered, so I'm not worried about that. Reach back for my oil bottle and give a few shakes of this avocado oil. At least I think this is avocado, Leslie keeps switching it on me. I'm sorry. No, That's what I wanted to comment on for it's those cool. of us who are experienced in the kitchen and um, those who wish to learn. One of the greatest tools you can have is preparing and having everything in their uniform place so you can continue to produce recipes at an easier rate. And Absolutely. what Brian does by having the knife in front of him or the oil in the same place is continue to set himself up for success. So whether you need it for an adaptability reason or not, well, he throws them in for a big sizzle, um, is that allowing your tools to be in the same place really aids in any chef's toolkit for success. So here's the simple. I also had to turn on my vent here over my stove, and I also opened my front door and back door screens, even though it's only 45 degrees outside. I'll give that a quick stir. Bring the heat down and now. Using a plate as a spoon rest. I'm going to reach up here for a couple of shakes of. Salt. I usually have a salt uh, cellar over here and use it, use the uh, pinch method for salting things. But again, I had to reschedule things a bit to get all of this in the kitchen and camera ready. So a little bit of ground pepper. And, and Brian, I'm going to ask if you can speak up just a little bit more because that sizzle is overwhelming our ears and our senses. I got you. I wish, what do they always say? I wish you had smell of vision too, but we don't. I'm going to use a splatter screen. And there goes my fire alarm. One moment. Well, Brian takes care of the smoke alarm. I want to ask in the chat if anyone has questions for Brian, this is a great time to ask as well as questions about accessibility, maybe in your own home kitchen, work kitchen, or workspace, um, we have an audience available to answer any of those questions that you would be interested in. So the neighbors are used to my cooking and know that the fire alarm really doesn't mean there's a fire. So I'm safe so far. Now, while that 
doing a little bit of sizzling over there. I'm going to reach over and do a couple of things that go with these fajitas. This is a bowl of, of finely diced tomato. This is beefsteak tomato. And I'm going to add to it half a seeded finely diced jalapeno. There, the fire alarm went off. That's good. So I'm adding that. I also have here half a fine diced sweet onion. And a few full portions of diced red bell pepper. Brian, as you mix that up, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about accessibility in the supermarket. Often oh. labels don't have any indication other than for those who are cited. And so how do you um, tackle the supermarket and what are tips that you could give for the rest of us to make our supermarkets more accessible for everyone? Uh, they certainly are. Now I've done a number of things. I did some work with WGBH on one of their programs dealing with the joys of uh, supermarket shopping. We have things, devices that are um, barcode readers that will read when you scan the device or the product, you can read it and it will tell you many things about the product other than just what the product is. It's not an inexpensive device. It runs nearly $2,000 and it has access to an online database that it does this with, as well as inboard uh, storage for information. So if it's a store brand, you're less likely to be able to get the information than if it's a national brand. I'm going to give this a quick mix. My household has a person who thinks that cilantro tastes like soap. So I can't uh, put cilantro in things. Now I'm going to set this aside and move on to the second bowl. This bowl is empty, uh, but it's not going to be empty for long. Before I do that, I'm going to go back to my pot over here, give it another stir. I go by texture. You know, they say cook them till they're translucent. A lovely thought. It doesn't work in my universe. So I'm going to move the bench to the side now. Can you tell us what the translucent texture feels like for those of us who have it yet? It feels to... more rubbery than it does crunchy, if you will. So I use the edge of the spoon to tap on it and to push down on it. These are still reasonably, I and mean, they're not soggy or burning or anything like that by texture. You would know it if they start to caramelize too much, mostly by aroma rather than by texture. So now I'm going to take the colander with the meat in it. And I'm going to drop the meat into the center of the pan. Keep in mind that the, uh, the marinade I used had one third of its contents was oil. So oil went into the pan a bit as I put this meat in there. I'm going to leave that to cook. I don't want to stir it too much because I'm trying to get a sear on it. And if you move it around too much, you end up mostly steaming it rather than searing it. And get back to the sink. While you wash your hands, would you remind us what temperature you have the skillet at? The skillet, I brought it down to medium low at this point because I was concerned about my attention being drawn away from it too much. So I'm going to bring it back up to a little over medium, not much. I want to start to hear sizzling over here. Hopefully I will in spite of the vent. Now I'm moving back to the cutting board again because my wife loves a wonderful thing called guacamole. So, we like her for that. <laughs> so I've got a couple of Haas avocados here. And I'll cut those along the meridian. Lay it away, handle to the right. 
do a half turn. I'm going to set that one in the bowl. Again, use the tip of my knife to poke a little bit the seed and give it a lift out and into my garbage bowl. I'm going to do that for the second avocado here. And the meridian. Lead away, half twist. Oh, I'm going to have everything out of it. Moving on to this. Poke. Well, you make your delicious guacamole. Samantha in our chat has asked something for you, Brian. She wants to know, what do you look for in accessible devices in the kitchen? Are there places that you have a lot of options or do you have to just buy non-accessible devices and is it more of a trial and error experience for you? It's a mix of the two. There are certainly places where there are uh, adaptive cooking tools available for people, uh, but I don't rely exclusively on them. There's two reasons I don't. One is they're few and far between. And the second is they're expensive. If you think of what it costs for a standard instant read thermometer, double or triple that price for one that's accessible. If you are um, looking for a talking microwave oven, think double or triple the price for it to be a talking microwave oven. There are times when there's exceptions to that. When I bought my microwave oven, it was the latest and greatest from the particular company. And they were trying to convince able-bodied people that they needed a talking microwave oven. I don't know how they made the case, but they did. And so for two years, blind people could get one for less than $200. However, it was kind of a gimmick product and it didn't take too long before that same product either was not available or was only available at like say two or three times the cost of a similar feature product. Now I'm using a tool, remember I said family is very important to me and what I've learned. This is a tool given to me by my mother uh, less than a year before she passed away. So it scoops avocado out and makes slices out of it. Now I'm not doing it for slices and I'm doing it for the meat of the avocado, but that's what I'm doing while I'm talking to you and answering questions. So there are a couple of places online where you can buy some accessible things. There's a place called the LSNS group, another place called Maxi Aids. And here in my area, the place that I used to work at the Carroll Center for the Blind has an AIDS and appliances store and they carry some of these products. And when they don't carry them directly, they have access to all the catalog companies who will help you find what is available in terms of accessibility. That one's done. So along those same lines, another participant wants to know if the kitchen appliances that you use are all about universal or are they more human-centered design that's available? Right now it's more human-centered mm -hmm. design. The difficulty though is with white goods, refrigerators, stoves, um, washers and dryers, those kinds of things, where you do not buy them frequently. You, and many people, I keep reminding myself, I'm a homeowner, so I had to buy mine. But most blind vision impaired people, like most people, are renters. And they didn't choose the stove, refrigerator, washer, dryer. It was there as part of the rent. So under those circumstances, we learn to adapt to what we have more often than we find adaptive products that we can work with. We are working as a blindness community of advocates to work with companies like General Electric and Whirlpool and the like to get them to include concepts of universal design and uh, human-centered design. But it's a hard road to hope, especially when they're constantly looking for ways to innovate and innovate comes first and accessibility, generally speaking, comes second. Turning now to the sink here to wash up a bit. I have to tell you that I'm allergic to avocado, so I have to be careful to wash up whenever I'm working with that. I'm going to check my pan here again.
So I am now going to turn over here to that bowl where I captured some of the marinade. And I'm going to, by the way, see these measuring cups and spoons on the back panel here? They're not labeled in Braille. You can buy them so that they're labeled in print, large print and Braille for those with vision problems. But my experience has been that they've been fairly cheap and not particularly accurate. So I bought the top of the line here and I simply put them on the set of hooks in the order of their sizes. Full cup, half cup, third of a cup, quarter cup. So I'm gonna take my quarter cup, dip into my bowl of marinade, return to the pan, and add some of that flavor in. Then give it another stir. Describe to us what your kitchen smells like right now, Brian. Well, I have to say, you know, they talk about the different flavors out there, right? Salty, sweet, um, spicy, you know, those kinds of things. It smells more like umami here than anything else because of the use of Worcestershire and the aromatics of the bell peppers and the onions. Now, this is almost completely done. So I am going to ask Leslie, can you pass me over there the little bowl with the minced garlic? Indeed. For those just joining us, we have Brian Charlson from the Carroll Center for the Blind. He is showing us a recipe for fajitas and the fajita recipe will be available to all of you after this evening's conversation. If you have any questions for Brian about food or about accessibility in your home kitchens, please let us know in the chat below. I always add garlic last. It burns so easily uh, and it gets very bitter. So I put it in there. I'm going to bring the heat up even more because I want to hear that sizzle. And I'm having a hard time getting it over the vent. But now that it's not smoking so much, I'll turn that off. There we go. Can you get that sound effect? I think so. Ah, smells terrific. Smells perfect. Stirring that. Second, going to take. You've got out. people drooling in the chat here, Brian. Samantha wants a plate to go. <laughs> there you go, huh? I'm going to put it on this and push it back off the burner and make sure I turn that burner off. I'm not, I know my sighted friends occasionally forget to turn things off and I'm no different than they are. Now I'm going to swing back over here because I need to finish this guacamole so I can start doing a couple of other things. Leslie, could you hand me the sour cream from over there? Some people like theirs. The guacamole is different as night and day. I can't remember the name of the, the volcanic rock. Um, mortar and pestle mm -hmm. that Mexicans use. Mm. A little bit of taste there. Mm -hmm. um, but I always put sour cream in, in my guacamole to give it a more creamy texture. My One of my four people that I cook for in the family uh, hates spicy. The other three of us love spicy. So whenever I cook things, I have to keep in mind who's going to be the primary eater of that item. Vicky, the one who likes everything mild, can do guacamole and I can't. So under those circumstances, it is not likely to be spicy guacamole for them. The universal kitchen accessibility problem, cooking for picky eaters. Yes. <laughs> and when my sister came to live with us a couple of years ago, her style of cooking was not here's what's for dinner. It's here's your 55 options for dinner. <laughs> and it's not, it's very uncommon for all of us to sit down to the same meal at the same time. Not only a sous chef, I'm also a short order cook. <laughs> That's right. Now I had diced or sliced up here some lime. I'm going to put in some fresh squeezed lime juice here. Again, into the scrap bowl. 
I'm going to do two of those, I think. While you're squeezing your lines, I've got a question from Lisa. Lisa wants to know, um, when you're cleaning your kitchen up, aside from feeling for any kind of stick or debris on the foods that are left over, how would a visually impaired person know that the equipment is clean to cook in or eat with for your surfaces, your countertops, and your appliances? I am going to admit something, but it's reverse than what you would expect. Quite honestly, I find that blind people clean a kitchen better than any sighted person I've ever met. Because we cook in, or we clean until it feels clean. Doesn't look clean, it feels clean. I'm forever coming into this kitchen that has Corian countertops and wiping them down till they feel polished. Other people come in here with a wet cloth and give it a quick swipe. And if they don't see anything dirty on it, it must be clean. So in all, all honesty, it's feeling it all over makes all the difference. Uh, it's not unusual for me to open these cupboards in my face here and uh, find that a bowl I'm about to use was washed on the inside, but not so well on the outside. So it, it is something that I find, uh, at least blind people have a, a leg up because they care about how it feels. I'm zesting some of the peel off of this wedge of lime to add some of that lime flavor in there. Cool here now. That's a really cool tool. I've never seen that before. Do you think, Leslie, you could um, bring the camera in so the rest of us could see that zester up close? In fact, this is a kit. You can buy it from Pampered Chef. It is a citrus squeezer and it has this zester that fits on it when you stow it away. Oh, a nester zester. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. You're welcome. That's a nester zester. So, uh, and again, that's pampered chef that I got that from. One last stir of the guac here. Now I know some people like maybe some diced tomato in there or maybe some uh, scallions or something like that. And we'll, we'll get to putting some scallions in there in a bit. Now, I hate all that gets lost in a potato masher, but there you go. Does that feel clean to you? <laughs> no, it does not just feel clean Just asking for a friend. Yeah, just asking for a friend. <laughs> Good for you. Another quick rinse. I'll be dipping in some chips soon. <laughs> exactly. We missed the seasoning you put in your salsa because we were asking questions. So while you're finishing that guac, would you mind telling us the seasonings you threw into your tomato salsa, your pico de gallo? I am a Penzi's fanatic. Uh, so I get all of my spices by mail order from Penzi's. So I use this seasoning uh, that's a general purpose taco seasoning, but I have what, three or four different versions. Yes. One for chicken, one for pork, one that's super spicy and one that's mild every day. So I think I'm using the uh, more common original, original taco, taco mm -hmm. seasoning. Yeah, we yeah. notice you have Braille printed on top of your label. How is Penzi's in terms of accessibility for you? What would you like to see in the future to make it better? Well, it'd be lovely if they actually were able to do Braille labeling, but the likelihood of that is pretty, pretty low in this world. What really matters in the scheme of things for me is that I have the ability to add labels to things or have technology that I own. So this package does have a barcode on it and I could have used my scanner to scan it at the time, but I'm in what I call a mixed household. Two people have sight, two do not. So when any grocery item comes into the house before it's put away, my wife pulls out her braille writer, rolls some clear adhesive label stock into the braille writer and brails the label we do peel and stick and then things get put away. Part of keeping track of these things is labeling them, but part of it is also putting them in a particular order. So all of the tomato products, stewed tomatoes, tomato paste, those kinds of things are all together. All the beans, black beans, kidney beans, etc., cetera, are put together, that kind of thing. The, the future of these things there's a lot of effort going on right now to label things, but you're going to see it labeled more for mass products. If you watch uh, 
commercials on television. You're hearing more and more of them with a bit of audio description of the visual elements that aren't part of the dialogue. More importantly, many of those same companies like Procter & Gamble products are beginning to emboss Braille on the cardboard box that a product is in. And there are a number of other cosmetic companies are beginning to include in the actual bottle itself, the plastic bottle of hand lotion or shampoo, the name of what that product is. So we're making gains. The difficulty is the tooling of packaging is really, really expensive. So to get it tooled in such a way that labeling can happen automatically takes a bit of doing. Now, um, we're going to move on to, I got to make sure I've done all the bits and pieces I plan to. Yes, now comes assembly time. But I want to tell you that I don't cook just fajitas for dinner. I cook a full meal deal. So I'm going to turn to my two tabletop um, or countertop appliances, my Instant Pot over here. This Instant Pot is mostly accessible because it has true buttons on it that I can count as I go down to the sixth and final button on the side and be able to know that that's reliably a particular function. However, there's not enough space for me to put Braille by each one of those buttons. They're too close together. So what I've done is I've taken a piece of magnetic material. This is the kind of material that if you get a um, refrigerator magnet or something like that, that it's made out of this material. So I bought some at a craft store and carefully laid out what each button would be in the order it would be. So I know that on the left column here, we have soup and broth followed by meat and stew, followed by beans and chili, followed by cake, followed by slow cook, and finally saute. So I can figure out what it is I want on this sheet and then count down the right number of buttons on here. And the sheet, I can easily put it back on it because it's magnetic. So I can take it off to read it and put it back on rather than having to stand on my head to get the right angles. So in here, I made last night to be added to today's dinner, refried beans, you wanna show? Yes. From scratch. Yum, yum, yum. Leslie is stirring a pot of, uh, pale brown refried beans that look creamy and thick. There you go. My trick to good refried beans, do not be afraid of lard. <laughs> it's, a, it's the last thing I add. I get everything going, the taste I like, but the texture isn't quite there. So I add, oh, two to four, depending on the texture at that point, two to four tablespoons of lard, melt it and stir it in. And it adds that creaminess that's hard to get any other way. So that will be on the plate. The other thing that will be on the plate. Brian, someone wants to know if you put the magnetic strips for your Braille for your Instant Pot through a broiler? Through a Perkins broiler, that's correct. Mm -hmm. It was, I'm limited to 11, 11 inch wide carriage to do things on. And Braille is quite large. Um, so uh, it, it would, have to struggle sometimes and use abbreviations to pull that off. Now, this is my talking microwave. And I told you that things are frequently not fully accessible. So I'm pressing the, well, I would if it were talking. You're pushing the wrong button. Voice off. Okay, let's get voice off. Voice high. And I got the voice high. I wanna make sure it's clear. And in my, talking microwave oven, I've got a dish of Spanish rice. So that's going to be the third thing on the plate. Beans, rice, fajitas. Let me put it back in here. And let's give it, uh, start with a one minute heat up. Let me, let me start that. I want to do one thing here. This knob, the main knob here, can you get a view of that? I can. Um, as I turn it, it tells me what I'm selecting. There we go. Popcorn. Soup. I'm going on around to that. I'm going to go back here. Frozen vegetables. 
to popcorn. Now, if I select popcorn, please select wait. It says please select wait. The problem now arises that as I turn it, if the weight increases, it doesn't say anything. There is the click sensation of turning a rotor, but no indication of what that weight is. So I have to use that sparingly and only those areas where I'm doing things frequently, like popcorn, where I pop it in there and I know that the default weight is the typical size of the popcorn portion. Let me clear what I might have done and again hit that one, one minute, minute button express. and let that begin heating up. Now, last things I want to show you because I don't think I did this up here today. Last thing, it's uh, you, no, you did not I show in the midst. Okay, so get the tour tables again. I am always looking for mainstream products that can do a good service for me, and I found the company OXO called OXO to be one of the best companies for creating products I've enjoyed using. These are silicon on the outside and quilted fabric on the inside. And they're not done to such a degree that you feel like you're wearing welder's gloves. You get the protection from the heat, but you get real good flexibility. So I can feel things through them in a way that is essential for me to be able to interact with the kitchen. If you go looking at adaptive stores, they will frequently give you mitts that go up to your elbow, which to me is you know kind of like uh, <laughs> trying to cook in boxing gloves. It just doesn't work for me. So this works well for me along with those guards on the edge of my uh, stove racks. Where do I get my recipes? I get them from a variety of different places. This is a magazine. This is volume one of three volumes of the most recent um, Cook's Illustrated magazine by America's Test Kitchen. Now this includes no pictures and no ads, and yet it takes three of this size volume for one month's magazine. I also get Eating Well. Uh, Eating Well, unfortunately, is stopping hard production. And so I will only be able to read it electronically. I hope they publish it electronically in an accessible way. The other piece of technology that I use is this. It's called a refreshable Braille device. Before you move on to that, we're wondering where you order the Cook's Illustrated Braille edition. Do you have to get that special ordered from them? My wife happens to be the director of the Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library located on the Perkins campus. And uh, she keeps me well aware of what's available out there in accessible form. And that library also provided me with this refreshable Braille device. I'm gonna turn it on now. Uh, that's what I would intend to do. Come on, Brian. There. Oh, oh, because I was already on. That's what my problem was. There we go. So I get 20 characters of Braille shows up at a time. And this is totally changing my life when it comes to cookbooks because I can put on a single SD card every Braille cookbook ever produced and still have room to double the size of that collection. Downstairs, I have two bookcases that hold my hard copy uh, cookbooks. One of them is The Joy of Cooking, and it's the latest edition, and it comes in 36 Braille volumes measuring 12 inches by 12 inches by four inches. It takes an entire six foot tall bookcase for one cookbook, but there's something about cookbooks that I love. I, I sit down and read them like novels, uh, looking for ideas, those kinds of things. So this device helps make my entire cookbook collection available to me in the kitchen rather than in a back room somewhere where I get to figure out which volume has the content I'm looking for. Well, speaking of size that uh, cookbooks take up when they're in Braille, Lynn wants to know about using an iPad to read recipes aloud with the speak select feature. Certainly you can do it in a variety of different ways. You're right now being, okay, that way. Okay. Bob, Leslie is now telling me we got to dish up. So we're doing that now. I'm going to have her be my sous chef. You're not and, stressed for time at all, Brian. Take your time. Okay. So she's busy putting that together. Hold on, I got to go back to my device over here, which is bleeping at me like 
did you forget to turn me off? And the answer is yes, I forgot to turn you off. There you're off. So I use a number of talking devices. And I don't have an iPad. There's no re reason for me to have something that large when I'm listening to things. I can get all that same thing here from my iPhone. Now, I got to make sure that I'm holding this correctly. Leslie tells me I tend to hold it so you see up my nose. Hopefully that's not the case. Uh, nonetheless, I use a number of devices here in my kitchen. I have an Amazon uh, Echo device. Computer, what time is it? Wrong device answered. Computer, what time is it? It's 6.59 p.m. Computer, give me a recipe for fajitas. Finding some fajitas recipes. Okay, for fajitas, I recommend fajitas from Food Network. Three hours, 10 minutes to make. What would you like? Start recipe, send to phone, add to list, or hear next recipe. Cancel. So I use these devices. You notice I haven't used any timers here today because I use a variety of devices in order to do what I do in the most effective way. I have in my apron here, a talking thermometer. Uh, it opens up like a Swiss army knife. And if I were right now, I'll just get the air temperature. And it will work in Fahrenheit or centigrade. And it's an instant read thermometer. So I use it quite a bit, especially in the summer when I use my smoker where temperature matters quite a bit and you get to check it out multiple times during the course of the day uh, or of the cook. So I use those devices, but again, it's always a mix of mainstream products, adaptive products and things somewhere in between that are almost accessible. I also use a couple of services, one called Be My Eyes and one called Ira. Be My Eyes is a free service where you ask it to find somebody who can look through your camera on your behalf. So when I was using my Instant Pot the other night, I wanted to know how many more minutes it was going to have to cook before I could uh, cause it to, to drop pressure. Because that's on the screen, and there's no way for me to tell. Uh, I used Be My Eyes, pointed the camera, said all I need to know is how many minutes are left on the display. They told me, I thanked them and we moved on. All of the people in that program are volunteers and they come from all around the world. So you have to be a little careful what you ask them to do. On the other hand, there's a service I get for a dollar a minute called IRA. They're professionally trained describers and they're under all kinds of legal obligations not to repeat things and to delete things once they take a look at them, that kind of thing. And I use them when I'm looking for things that are a little bit more uh, confidential in nature. Yes, camera lady, Leslie. Nobody's complaining about my nose. Don't worry about it. Well, speaking of tech products, um, we've got a question for you. They wanna know, You've experienced a lot of great tech products over your 30 years at the Carroll Center. So what is one tech product you find most helpful? My iPhone, because it's a utility device. I can use it to access important services. I can use it to do things directly, such as that barcode reading. I don't have to buy a barcode reader anymore. My iPhone is my barcode reader. I can go to uh, the grocery store and use it to identify a product. Though I tend to go to grocery stores with sighted friends, um, mostly as a matter of expedience than anything else. I really don't wanna bring my groceries back on public transportation uh, if I can avoid it. I own a minivan, so I'll get somebody to drive my van for us and we'll do their shopping and my shopping at the same time. But in terms of one device that gives me the most accessibility generally, it would be my iPhone. I have nothing against Android-based phones, but iPhones tend to be the thing that things get developed first through. Leslie's taking the phone from me. Is it time for the glamour shot? Leslie? It is almost time for the glamour shot. Got to have glamour shot. You put a little purdies on your plate there. All right, let's we'll see what Okay, so you got a look. I got a look. Okay, this Go is it. the salsa. Salsa. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Salsa. I guess I carried away from it. <laughs> you will have to pick it up after. Yes, exactly. Salsa in there. And this is the guac. That is guacamole. That means I won't be eating this one. You will. Oh. You like guacamole? Don't that you? is too bad. I will have to eat that. <laughs> oh, Aren't you all jelly right now? Leslie, you will have to let us know how it tastes. Mm -hmm. And yes, sour cream, please. I will do some cheese first. Ooh. It has my transitioned feet. from you plating up a meal for yourself to you making Leslie's dinner. There you go, huh? <laughs> How's that? She knows how her bread is buttered, so to speak. This is true. And that was, you like a little sour cream, don't you? Uh, no. No, that's right. You that's can't. That's right. She's dairy intolerant. I'm lactose intolerant and obnoxious. He usually says that together like that. <laughs> you have a little bit in the guacamole. Okay. Okay. No I'm problem. Sorry. That's all good. Uh, and now, because you are a green onions fan. I am. I do love me some scallions. A little bit of green onion on there. How about over here on the refry? Yes, please. Right forward or back? Back. Da, da, da. And lastly, did I yeah, a chip standing up in a refried beans. So there's the glamour shot. There's the glamour shot. We've got applause from our audience and lots of hearts going into the chat for you, Brian. Awesome. So I want to make one or two more quickie comments if I can, if I have time. And that is back when I owned my Let's see, so they've got to be careful to stand so that you don't see the disaster that's a dining room <laughs> table where we moved everything from the kitchen for this Just so you know. for this effort. Anyway, Leslie and I have been watching on HBO Max, Julia, the new episodic program on Julia Child and how she came about doing her French chef show on WGBH. And I got such respect for her prepping for today because we had to clear out the kitchen, clean the kitchen, prep the kitchen, uh, walk out what we were going to do in what order so that Leslie wasn't constantly having to dance behind me to uh, have the camera pointed in the right direction. So thank you for tolerating uh, our amateur hour when it comes to doing this, but know that Julia earned every dime she ever earned. <laughs> Well, today you were our Julia Child, and I want to let you know it was far from amateur hour. We have got comments coming in, letting you know that people are drooling. They're saying the beans look amazing. We've got others saying this is amazing. We've got some well done, amazing, looks fantastic. Thank you for sharing. We're coming over for dinner tonight. Everyone is really <laughs> enjoying these fajitas. At, at some point in the future, a blind person or a low vision person is going to come to you looking for a job in your kitchen. Remember today, please. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a terrible employment problem for blind and vision impaired people. While well, the world out there is moaning at uh, double digit unemployment, blind people have experienced 70% unemployment since the beginning of time. Even with all this technology and all this ability, the biggest battle to finding that job is to convince a sighted employer that a blind person can do it. And I think I've convinced some people here today that with the right technology, the right adaptive skills to go along with it, and a bit of imagination, a blind person can be an effective employee in a, a modern kitchen. Very well said. Thank you so much, Brian. Again, for everyone, we're gonna throw the recipe up. Um, Someone in the comments wants a shot of the fajitas one more time. And as I say that, I've got some questions um, about having a baking segment left after this. I wanna let everyone know that we anticipated having um, Alexis Hilliard from Stump Kitchen as our next segment. She was gonna do vegan and gluten-free uh, drop biscuits tonight, but unfortunately she had an issue and she could not attend with us just very last minute today. So what we are missing out is the dessert from 
um, Alexis Hilliard. I want to throw into the chat for everyone Alexis's YouTube while Leslie shows us a beautiful shot of the fajitas and let everyone know that you're welcome to leave early but because we don't have Alexis with us tonight if you would like to stay and personally ask Brian any questions he anticipated being with us through the rest of the evening so if you um, have any more longer in-depth questions now would be the time to do so but other than that thank you all uh, for joining us we're going to move on to the living room and take a seat <laughs> You ask Echo to turn on the lights. Echo, turn on front living room lamp. Echo, turn on front living room lamp. We've got a few people saying thank you so okay. much to you, Brian, the people who have to head out. For anyone else still here, we're going to stay on with our extra time and ask Brian some questions about accessibility, things in the kitchen, everything in between. Before you all leave, I just want to thank you for being here from Boston University's program um, in gastronomy, as well as the uh, Disability and Inclusion Office. Um, and if you're interested in any other accessibility options, uh, please let us know if we can partner or create any content that you need for your future kitchen. I'm sorry, did I miss that question? You didn't, I was just thanking people and now I've got some questions rolling in. Um, Dana has posted something in the chat for everyone if they would like to learn more about Brian. Um, specifically, Brian, we've got a longer question for you, uh, wondering about how you figured out the kitchen techniques in your own kitchen. Did you have to learn? Um, did you have help from other visually impaired folks? How was that process of learning how to access your own kitchen? Well, I would say the, the, the real answer is necessity is the mother of invention. When I was young, and I'm now 66 years old, when I was young, um, went on to college, I could not afford to go out to eat. I had to cook in if I was going to eat anything. So I learned to cook in that respect. Secondly, um, all of my early life was a matter of pinching pennies. I remember the uh, first kitchen not in an apartment that I had any control over. I ended up uh, having a friend of a friend who won a stove on the game show on TV called The Price is Right. And they couldn't use the stove. So they sold it to me at a, at a fraction of the real cost. Unfortunately, it was a built-in stove and I did not have that space. So I had to build the cabinet to house the stove to get the free stove. So I've always been a do-it-yourselfer kind of person out of financial necessity. Now, uh, over that same period of time, um, I'm very socially active. So some of my first cooking um, socially was at uh, group picnics. So I want you to imagine that in my backyard right now, I have an in-ground 20 by 40 foot swimming pool. And it has a deck along the shallow end. And at one end of that deck, I have a large barrel smoker. And at the other end of that um, pool level deck, I have a tent gazebo with a gas barbecue in it. And I spend my summers typically hosting parties every two or three weekends of somewhere between five and 25 people doing some of them as charity uh, where we raise money for some charity or other by selling tickets to it. And when I cook hamburgers on the gas grill, I lay them out in rows and columns, leaving the far right hand region empty. And then I can run my palm face down above the burgers and tell where one burger ends and the next one begins by the heat sneaking up between the burgers. I use a spatula not to pick up a burger and put it back down where it came from, but to pick it up and flip it to its right, going from the right-handmost rack onto that open space, and then the next row 
to what was vacated by the first row, et cetera, till I flipped over all the burgers. So I do that kind of concept when I'm cooking. And I did that by trial and error and by simple conversation with other blind people. I have a friend who used to own a bed and breakfast out on Nantucket, and she is the best baker I've ever met. And whenever she's in a car with me, all we do is talk food and how we get around one problem or another uh, with things. That we sounds like a lot of us in the food world. Brian, while you're answering that question, I'm gonna ask you a quick little follow-up. Um, people are wondering about uh, your recipes and someone wanted to know what your favorite dish to cook or bake would be. Well, favorite thing to cook is jambalaya. Um, I, I, I like spicy food in general. My favorite cuisines are Sichuan Chinese, Thai, um, Indian. Uh, let's see what else. Mexican, of course. Indian. Uh, Indian, all those kinds of things. So I like spice a lot. Uh, so jambalaya works for me. Making the roux is the fun part. And uh, thanks to America's Test Kitchen, I learned a new way to make roux that has made it so I don't have to dedicate so much time. Because, you know, they say cook it until it reaches a particular color. That doesn't work very well, does it? Right, I was gonna ask, how do you figure that out? Exactly, so cook it to a certain appearance doesn't work, but cooking it to a certain texture, when you get close to that perfect point, what was pasty becomes grainy. Mm -hmm. You can feel under the spoon in the pan that it's grittier than it used to be. Now that's fine if you're using the oil and flour approach. But these days, that's not how I make my roux. I take the flour, I put it in a roasting pan in the oven, and I roast the flour for a specific length of time till it becomes the color based on oven temperature and time. And then I take that and keep it in a, a mason jar in my cupboard. And whenever I want to make something that calls for a roux, I just add a couple of tablespoons of that roasted flour and you get all the flavor. And if you're concerned, none of the fat. Well, I think the fat serves its own purpose and I don't want to discourage the use of that. Anybody who's lard in their refried beans should not be afraid of fat. Um, we've got a question for you after we're done drooling, thinking about jambalaya. Um, <laughs> What is your most frustrating part of navigating recipes? Specifically, what's the number one thing website owners, maybe people who create food blogs could do to make accessibility better on their part? Acknowledge the value of your other senses. A good cook ought not to do everything by vision. For example, when I put oil in my skillet this evening, I waited till my skillet was scorching hot that's why I like to use cast iron. It takes longer to come up to temperature, but it stays there. And then I add the oil. Recipes will say, put the oil in until it, and let it heat up until it begins to shimmer. I can't tell shimmer. Cook the onions until they're translucent. I can't tell translucent, but I sure can tell you can heat the pan, add the oil, and almost immediately add the other item without worrying that the oil wasn't at temperature. I've got a cat putting its tail under my nose like it's a mustache. Um, anyway, so there's, there's that. Um, again, so much emphasis on the color of things rather than the texture or smell of things. When you want to roast something, doesn't matter what it is, when you want to roast something, you should be paying attention to the aroma. It should smell caramelized. Um, when you want something um, to be a little lighter, then you leaned toward the texture of things. I'm forever tapping things with the edge of a spoon or a knife in order to check the texture of things by its, not only the sense of touch, but also the sense of sound associated with that. And those are skills I can't 
articulate enough how useful they are for people of all abilities to have a multi-sensory approach in their kitchen. Um, I've got two last questions for you before we go, Brian. Uh, Samantha is very impressed. She's wondering if there's anything you can't cook and she wants to know what was the hardest thing for you to cook, kind of adapt to your kitchen? <laughs> Leslie says bacon, but she's wrong. She just doesn't like bacon cooked the way I do. I cook it like you would in a restaurant. I wouldn't pull out a skillet and pan fry it. You do a sheet tray? Mm -hmm. I would lay it out on a rack in a uh, half sheet pan and bake it to the texture I want. It confines the grease. It gives you even cooking. An oven is always going to be a more even cook than is going to be a stovetop. So if you can get roughly the same experience with either thing, then I'm, I'm an oven believer. And I frequently cook things partly on the stove and finish them off in the oven for that reason. Um, no, I think that the hardest thing for me to be able to do is to portion out dough or batter. I use what some people call ice cream scoops to try to get an even amount of batter in each cup when doing muffins and that kind of stuff. I use it to get an even size cookie when baking cookies, that kind of thing. But it is still, you know, you make a recipe that's supposed to do a two layer cake and you're supposed to put half in each one. Uh, the only way I've found to get even close to doing that right is to use a scale. So roughly get it where you want it to be, put them both on the scale, see which one needs to have some taken away and some added to it to do that. So Leslie finds that what I ask her to help me out with, if I just don't have the patience today to do it, is to come portion it out. And I wouldn't be a good uh, Boston University student if I didn't mention for those who are interested in learning more about sensory cooking and the aspects of cooking, we have a course as part of our master's program um, called Food in the Senses, which dives really deep into the sensory aspects of food. Um, I have one last question for you and then everyone is ready to go and have a delicious dinner, hopefully of fajitas tonight. <laughs> We're wondering as our last question, Brian, are there any communities that you have found that have supported your ability to learn to cook? Specifically, many people become visually impaired later in life. And we're wondering if there are any resources or places that they can go to learn more so they can be a successful cook. I guess the, the best answer is places like the Carroll Center. There are what they call adult rehabilitation centers. Most services that are funded by government are for people of employment age. But in recent years, as Congress itself has gotten older, there's been more attention given to services for older persons. Um, I will tell you that the tendency is to try to simplify things in these places. For example, that will teach you how to make Spanish rice from a box. Leslie's smirking over there because she wanted me to do that for today and I wouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to cook for a culinary class, culinary class, and use rice aroni for God's sake. Not gonna do it. But <laughs> you could have. We would have let you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but I enjoy the cooking from scratch part. I cook for the fun of it. I you can't tell it perhaps by camera, but in the past two and a half years, I've gone from 312 pounds to 222 pounds, a so 90 pound drop in weight. So congratulations. You can and still maintain your weight. But I think that that's by getting the joy out of the cook as much as out of the eat part of the experience. So I would say senior centers do a lot these days, but there's this tendency to be overly cautious about what to do. I've seen a cook class where for uh, seniors who are losing their vision, where the goal is to boil water and to safely, and I mean, they're, they've got, like I said, the oven mitts up to their armpit. They've got, uh, they're doing everything on an induction top so that there's never a hot surface. Those induction cooktops are becoming quite popular for 
especially for older people who are mm -hmm. typically cooking for one instead of a family, because uh, they tend to be more typically a single burner type operation. But you also have to have the right kinds of pots and pans to use them effectively. So I say, I, I have friends, by the way, who are out there buying used stoves so as to continue to have, quote, real burners on their stoves. I love these flat surface, smooth surface, because they're so much easier to clean. Um, but they say, how can I possibly get my pan on it? I can't see the burner. Please stop thinking about what you can't see. Think about what you can feel in the scheme of things. So I put that pot nearly on the burner right. And then, in fact, I turn burners on and then put the pot on. All I'm trying to do is block the heat with the pan. And I've succeeded in, in mastering that part of things. So it's really Get out there find and do it. out from your state agency for the blind what private not-for-profit entities teach elders skills of daily living and uh, do a bit of shopping around. We're lucky we're in Massachusetts. We have the Carroll Center. We have the Lowell Association for the Blind. We have the Mass Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So there's a number of different private not-for-profits who look to help blind and visually impaired people of all ages master the skills of blindness. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brian. For those of us who are still here, this recording will be available on YouTube later from Boston University. And uh, so you can access it anytime you want. Thank you so much from myself, my team at Boston University, to Brian for being here, to Leslie for helping operate the phone. We really appreciate it. And now all of us are hungry for fajitas and to have a more accessible food future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now.